Hello, thank you for joining Child Development 101. My name is Amy Malloy. I'm the project director of the School Mental Health Resource and Training Center at the Mental Health Association in New York State. I'm joined today by my colleague, Whitney Clausen, our family education specialist. At the Mental Health Association, we work to raise awareness about mental health in an effort to reduce stigma and discrimination and promote wellness and recovery. The School Mental Health Resource and Training Center was established with funding from New York State to help schools implement a law requiring mental health instruction as part of the K-12 health curriculum. For the past several years, we've been proud to partner with New York State PTA on a number of initiatives and are thrilled once again to be a part of your annual conference. Here's a brief overview of today's goals. In line with our mission, we'll talk about child development in the context of mental health. We'll provide you with some practical strategies to support youth mental health with a focus on social emotional development. And we'll provide some resources that you can bring back to your school community. We often start by defining mental health. You know, in previous generations, the term mental health was synonymous with mental illness or mental health disorders. Many of you, if you have older children, are of the age where that's how we talked about mental health, if we talked about mental health at all. At Mahaney's, we encourage a more global perspective of mental health. And this comes from the World Health Association, who says, there is no health without mental health. They define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the presence or absence of an illness. And so we think about mental health as being along a continuum from well to unwell. And it's an important part of our overall health. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how we can keep ourselves along the well end of the continuum. In addition, how can we keep our children along the well end of the continuum? But first we wanna just get some context about mental health disorders and how prevalent are they among our children. As it turns out, research shows that nearly half of all children up to 18 years old will at some point in their life meet the criteria for a mental health disorder. Half of all lifetime prevalences of mental health disorders begin by the age of 14 and 75% begin by the age of 24. So mental health challenges are very real for young people. And one of the things that um, is helpful for us to think about is how we might be able to provide those prevention and early intervention skills to young people so that we can keep them in that well end of the continuum. We know that for some children, they will develop a mental health problem, but the severity of that mental health problem, the duration of that mental health problem will all depend on a number of different things, how early they get help, and what kind of coping strategies they have. And so those are areas that we as parents and caregivers can help develop. And mental health problems also often present as challenges in the classroom in as early as elementary school. And part of this comes from the fact that children with mental health problems such as depression also have some co-occurring disorders that might create some challenges for them in the classroom. 75% of children with depression also have an anxiety disorder and 50% also have a behavioral disorder. So it's not uncommon for some of these challenges to present in elementary school, but if we don't recognize them as emerging mental health problems, we might be viewing them differently. So what we had hoped for as part of mental health education law was that not only are we able to teach kids about mental health, but that we're able to teach school staff and parents as well. And we're really grateful for opportunities like this to bring some of this information to you. Now to kind of change gears and think a little bit more about child development. Um, there's a lot of different child development theories, but just for the sake of the time we have today, we wanted to just focus on one. And that is, um, you'll see on your screen here, a theory known as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is a very common childhood development theory that many educators in fact were taught when they were going to school. If you start at the bottom of the triangle, it's broken into five different levels, and each one is a need that has to be met before moving to the next level. So the first one includes basic needs, such as clean water, food, adequate warmth and rest. Unfortunately for many of us, there are factors that create challenges in these areas. Depending on where you live or your financial situation, you might have access to, or you might have limited access to healthy food. In addition, there's daily stressors that might impact our ability to sleep. The next level is safety, both in our homes and in our communities. 
This also includes safe housing, stable housing, a secure job, and unfortunately, we know that over the past few months, many families in New York State and across the nation, in fact, have struggled in these areas, both meeting those basic needs and finding that safe, secure, and stable housing. Um, so it's important for us to kind of recognize that these challenges are not uncommon, maybe for yourself or other families in your community. And on the next slide, I'm going to give you some um, links for where you can get some help and resources in that area because help is available. The next one is love and belonging. And, you know, there's kind of this idea that if, I don't know, I think it might have been a song, love is all you need. <laughs> but if we just have love and security and that sense of belonging, everything's going to be fine. But in fact, that's right here in the middle of this triangle. If we don't have those basic needs met, no matter how much we care and love for one another, there's going to be struggles. So love and belonging is really important, but there's a lot that happens before that too. Love and belonging includes safe, intimate relationships, as well as friendships, and these foster individual growth and development, help us feel connected, and part of something bigger than ourselves. The next is self-esteem. Having positive relationships and um, people in our lives who can influence us, this can also help us develop a little bit deeper in the area of self-esteem and provide us with a greater sense of accomplishment from a personal view and empower us to reach our future goals, which takes us to the tip of the triangle here, self-actualization. This is where our greatest potential is recognized when we're able to achieve all the things that we've set out to do. So again, if you think about it, without those basic needs, it's really hard for us to get to that level. So for child development, a lot of it is really focused on how do we meet those basic needs of young people? And you know this probably as family members and caregivers, you've seen this in your community. And if you're an educator, you've seen this in schools as well. Now you know the theory behind it. And as I said, in these areas, we're experiencing lots of struggles, especially now. Many people have lost jobs. People are struggling financially. This is a difficult time. I know that has been said over and over again, um, but we can't underestimate how difficult it can be sometimes. So we want you to know that help is available. At the School Mental Health Resource and Training Center, we have a link um, to a searchable database. So if you visit our website at the address here and you click on resources, it will take you to a searchable database. You can put in your county, you can put in the kind of resources that you need. It can help you with stable housing. It can help you with clinical um, counseling services. It can help you find doctors. It can help you find food um, or shelter, anything that you need. We wanna be able to help you. So child development theories are one example um, of kind of how we can work to support youth. The other place that we need to spend a little bit of time talking about is the brain, the developing brain. And we're gonna focus on stressors and how they impact a child's developing brain. So brains develop in three sections primarily. There's the brain stem, which is responsible for those basic survival functions. This means your heart rate, this is breathing. This is where you, as a means of survival, develop this flight, fight, or freeze response, usually in response to a stressor. The next system that develops is the limbic system. And this is where your emotions develop. This has to do with your emotion regulation. This has to do with memory. And then the last part of our brain that develops is the cortex. And this is where we are able to develop our attention skills, our problem solving skills. And the brain develops in that order from the basic survival to the regulating emotions and the problem solving and that critical thinking. So kind of makes sense if you have children in your life, you know that those basic survival skills are the things that they need, that they have developed um, the best. They're hungry, they cry, they let us know. They're angry, they fight, they let us know. Um, those basic survival skills are developing first. Later on, they begin those problem solving skills. Something else that happens in the developing brain is this process that's called bursting and pruning. So throughout child development, as the brain is developing, it is constantly creating new neural networks. And that's the bursting. And this happens at a phenomenal rate. It happens so quickly. However, 
we also know that the developing brain is has so much of that development going on that it engages in this process of pruning away the things it doesn't need. So there's this incredible growth that's happening, but there's this elimination of those connections that aren't needed if they're not being reinforced, if they're not viewed as being necessary. So there's this process of bursting and pruning. And the reason that that's important for us is because it signals to us that as adults and caregivers, we have an opportunity in the developing brain to reinforce the things that we want reinforced. So this is where we're able to help them move through those um, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example. When, we, when their basic needs are being met, we're sort of nurturing those neural networks um, when we are able to provide that love and belonging, we're nurturing those neural networks and other things that are not being reinforced are eliminated. And this gives us a little bit of hope in knowing that even when our kids suffer from stressors or losses or traumas, that there is opportunity for us to mold um, how those neural network connections are being formed and which ones remain. And I don't know about you, but for me, brain science is a little bit of a difficult um, topic. So I'm going to sort of bring it back for you and kind of share a story um, that maybe some of you can relate to. This is not a child developing that we're talking about. This is a dog and his name is Juno. And Juno's story goes like this. Juno lived on a farm and he frequently got into the chicken coop. And so the farmer shot him. He escaped, he ran away um, and he was caught and he was rehabilitated um, and he was given to a family, my family as a matter of fact. And Juno came to us when he was about two or three years old, obviously experiencing some trauma. Um, there was other reasons for us to believe that there might have been some abuse happening in the home based on the way he responded to things like the kids horsing around or certain types of vehicles. Um, he had definitely um, was practicing that fight, flight, freeze kind of a response. If he heard loud noises, whether it was fireworks or bubble wrap being popped, um, he he went right into flight mode. He ran right away. If he saw kids like horse playing or wrestling around on the floor, he automatically went into this fight mode where he got into the middle of it and would um, kind of growl at whoever he thought had the upper hand. This was his survival response. This was his automatic response. And so that continued for quite some time. <laughs> um, but because we were able to nurture some of those other responses, because we were able to meet his needs, because he understood his expectations and, and limitations um, in our home, although he's not supposed to be on the couch and in this picture he is on the couch, um, he developed some really positive neural connections. And over time, those kind of responses sort of went away. Um, and he actually became somebody who was really loving and gentle with people, which was kind of amazing considering the trauma that he had gone through. And so I share that story with you as an example of how even though a child might experience stressors, they may experience trauma with the right kind of nurture and response and meeting those basic needs, um, we can really form some positive connections in their brain um, so that they are not always reliant on that fight, flight, freeze response. And one of the ways that we do this with children is through social emotional learning. And this is an, um, kind of a diagram here to show you what social emotional learning is. It's something that's used very often in schools now, especially across New York State. Um, but I think that it has some relevance with families as well. Social emotional learning looks at these core competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And essentially, what we're doing in schools now is teaching these some skills to students to help them develop these areas. And Whitney is going to go through each of those areas for us to give us a better idea of 
what happens in those develop in that competency development? What are we really talking about when we talk about self awareness? But more importantly, she's going to give us some tools and strategies that we can use as family members to help develop that as well. So Whitney, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. And I really appreciate you sharing that story about Juno. It is really amazing how resilient people and animals uh, can actually be. So thank you for that. Um, like you said, we are going to dive a little bit deeper now into the five um, core skills that Amy mentioned. So let's start with self-awareness, which is a person's ability to identify and understand their own emotions, thoughts, values, and how they inf how those influence behavior across all aspects of our life. So this is like Amy mentioned, when the young ones in our lives are angry, they tend to act out physically. Um, and then even helping the older kids in our lives understand their self-awareness um, in terms of how they respond to certain people in social settings, those types of things are important to develop um, early on. So one important thing is being able to look at our individual strengths and limitations while engaging in an optimistic self view that really stems from that growth mindset perspective. Um, basically, we wanna be able to just keep ourselves pushing forward through all of these challenges. So some ways that we can do this include engaging in mindful activities, which doesn't have to be hard. So I like to think of these as just daily tasks that I can slow down. Um, you know, maybe it's a walk, I'm focusing on cleaning up or cooking, things like that. Um, as long as I'm not giving extra attention to those stressful thoughts, that's great. Um, but another way is by giving attention to those thoughts, you can journal and get them out in a productive way um, or even create activities with your family like high low, right? So at the end of the day, you can process and talk about the highs and lows in your day, which will help to gain some perspective and help you process things as they're happening during the day. Um, this is also important because it helps us to remember that even the smallest win is something that can be celebrated. So we really like that. Next is going to be social awareness. And so while self-awareness is critical, so is social awareness. We need to first be aware of what we're doing, thinking and feeling so we can better understand how those behaviors and thoughts impact the others in our lives and how they may be feeling in certain situations and understand that they may, that may be different from what we're going through based on their personal lived experiences and their engagement with systems that are available to them. So one thing we really like to highlight is the celebration of diversity. Um, you can do this through culture, art, music, museums, or just learning about other people. So we, by doing this, you can strengthen relationships, increase that social awareness, practice more kindness and empathy, promote sense of connectedness, and really show that we appreciate the abilities and strengths of others and can work together more effectively and collaboratively. We can also make these positive contributions by being kind to our environment and being mindful of our impact. So making conscious choices like refillable water bottles or thrifting or reusing items, which is something I'm really good at, um, picking up trash along nature walks or went out in the community, recycling bottles. Um, these are just a few ways to really be mindful and be socially aware. Um, so socially, we can all play our part in keeping each other on that well end of the continuum and offering support to other people um, when they need it. So being able to pay attention to our needs, you know, that's one thing, but then we actually have to be able to manage and self-regulate those feelings in a way that's constructive and not causing harm or pushing us towards the unwell of that continuum. So if you're experiencing um, mood changes or someone in your home is, it's kind of advised to start to track those, right? You want to maybe list your day on a scale of one to five or color code a couple feelings and just write it down at the end of the day what that day's overall feeling was like. However you choose to do this, the goal that we want to reach here is just to be able to pick up on any trends that are happening, um, any thing that shows up like, you know, every Monday I'm really sad and tired. So that might mean maybe we need a little self-care and support over the weekend to get back on a better track. So um, by mood tracking, it kind of helps us identify those areas of need and then it lets us know when we can use the skills that we've developed. So taking the initiative to manage our emotions and stress is challenging, but having those skills built up ahead of time can really, really help with that. Um, helping to create healthy routines is also really 
part of the process. Um, doing these things just once or twice, you know, might work in the moment, but we want to be used to doing these things more than once. And as role models, we can show them that as well, that we have stressors and here are some positive things that we do to manage those. So setting goals and keeping ourselves self-motivated can also help. Um, but again, these skills are important and they promote overall mind-body wellness. So responsible decision-making is the next one we're gonna touch on. And this talks about the importance of critical thinking and how evaluating our personal impact um, makes us a more valuable member of our community. So for example, say something came up when you were doing the high-low activity. Um, these conversations can be difficult. So instead of just jumping right to a solution, maybe brainstorming possible um, answers together can be helpful. Um, I know a lot of times we like to jump right into that um, solution-focused problem-solver mode, but sometimes just brainstorming together can be a better place to start and every voice can be heard and we can really talk about the benefits and consequences to certain decisions and it can help um, you know, make that choice a little bit clearer. Another thing that might help with this is to do would you rather cards or uh, kickstart conversations. So basically having a mix of silly and real life questions can help these things uh, by preparing us to kind of address them before they actually happen, right? So we don't always have that time to be proactive, but in this case, you might say, what would you do if you saw someone um, drop a $5 bill on the sidewalk and the person behind them picked it up without returning it? You know, what would you do if you were that second person? You know, little things like that, that are real life examples, um, which can just help us um, decide what kind of person we wanna be. And um, throughout these, discussions, if we stay open-minded, promote kindness, and the importance of being an upstander for those who need us, uh, we can hopefully engage in more effective problem solving and break those negative cycles and have a more positive personal impact on the world around us. So next, we will talk about those relationship skills. Um, relationships are very powerful, and as family members, you guys know um, it's that one-on-one -on -one time is super critical. So a lot of our time, unfortunately, though, is spent directing the people in our lives, asking them if they've done this or done that. So sometimes if we can keep things light and just model these pro-social skills like communication, teamwork, and problem solving, we can hopefully teach them by setting that example for them and really having them see firsthand what that looks like. Maintaining healthy relationships does require some set of boundaries though, and this is important to protect everybody involved. And practicing nice ways to say no can really help with this um, because it's so easy to say yes and wanna commit to everything, but then we end up feeling overwhelmed and stressed because we've overcommitted to too many responsibilities. So by helping ourselves and children understand that sometimes it's important to say no, um, that can really help us because in life, as we know, we don't always get what we want. So kind of preparing them for that as well can be helpful. Um, other activities for relationship building might be uh, to write cards or letters to people in our lives right now and let them know that we're thankful for them. Let them know that we care about them. You know, these things can be extra special during these times where we may not feel physically connected to our loved ones. And we're approaching, you know, the end of the year where a lot of times people are coming together. So this can be particularly challenging. So if we make time to get to know the people in our lives who inspire us, we may find that regardless of the length of time we've known them, we can actually discover something new and exciting. So I really encourage, encourage you guys um, to make this fun and, and see what you learn about the people in your home. Uh, and so now that we have highlighted that in the importance of nurturing our relationships, I do want to um, close out with another reminder about self care um, and how it's important to take time to nurture and care for ourselves too. So self care is obviously very important as we know, but it's more than just what we do to reduce stress. It actually allows us to become better at controlling our emotions, and that is going to look different for everybody, just like our emotions present differently, our coping skills and our self-care are going to be different as well. So this type of self-care practice, you know, it lets us know that we will have unpleasant feelings to navigate through, um, and it's important to still feel those too, unfortunately, but managing um, them is a way to keep us successful and moving forward along our path. 
Um, so we've provided some ideas here on your screen, but basically we just want you to make these simple changes and do them in a way where they can become part of your daily routine so they become most effective. Um, some of the ideas we have here include decluttering your space, limiting news or social media, eating a healthy diet, staying hydrated, spending more time in nature or with people or pets that you enjoy like Juno. Uh, you know yourself best, so you really will get to decide what works best for you, but we really just want you to take the time to stick to it and see if it can really make an impact and give you that clarity that you're looking for. So I appreciate you listening to all of that. I know um, those skills can be, um, you know, pretty detailed, but I'm going to pass it back to Amy and she's going to catch you up on some of the new and exciting stuff that we have going on at Mahaney's. So Amy, can you tell us a little bit about that and catch us up to speed? Sure. Thanks, Whitney. That was great. And so if you've enjoyed listening to how um, you can help support child development in some of these great strategies that, that uh, Whitney has shared, we have many, many more for you. So first, we have some learning communities coming up. And these are, um, we're kind of in the middle of a series of events with funding from the Mother Cabrini Health Foundation that's giving us the opportunity to have some informal discussions with family advocates. Um, we're screening some films during this time. We are um, launching a um, series of mindfulness videos in partnership with Peaceful School out in central New York. Um, we have some experts who are coming on providing some presentations for us and we're doing a book study. So there's a lot of really great stuff happening in the um, next couple of weeks. And if you missed anything, most of it is being recorded and will be available to you. So we encourage you to visit our website there. In addition, we do have a parents page where we have monthly webinars um, that are recorded and available for you. We have some tips for supporting mental health in the home, many of which you've heard today. Um, we have a list of some useful apps. We have lots of activities to practice coping strategies. And also we know that many of you are helping your children kind of move um, beyond secondary education in the next year or so. And so there's some information about if you have a child who is has some mental health concerns, what are some of the things you might want to consider looking at maybe um, college or a career or independent living. So there's some great resources there as well. Thank you for joining our webinar. We hope you found it helpful and we hope that it has encouraged you to think about how the Mahaney's School Mental Health Resource and Training Center can help educate parents and caregivers in your school community. When we began advocating for mental health instruction in schools nearly 10 years ago, it was our belief that not only is it important to raise the mental health literacy of children, but that as adults, we have a lot to learn as well. For many of us, we didn't talk about mental health when we were growing up, not in school and not in our homes. And if we did, it was usually about mental health disorders. Today, the conversations around mental health are more than just the presence or absence of an illness. We talk about mental health as an important part of our overall health. We all have mental health, just like we all have physical health, and there are things we can do to keep ourselves well, especially during these unprecedented times when the daily stressors of social distancing remote work and learning, racial and systemic injustice, and the uncertainty of the future of the pandemic is negatively impacting the mental health of many of our families. Please visit our website for resources and contact us to talk about how our staff can help educate and support your families. Thank you and be well.